Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our annual Startup Financing Trends webinar. My name is Kirsten Leuta. I'm a partner here at Osage University Partners, leading our university relations efforts. We'll go to the next slide. I'm joined today by three of my colleagues at OUP, Nee, Harry, and Nabil. I'm going to have each of them introduce themselves. Nee, could you start us off? Right. My name is Nee Dodiwamu, and uh, I'm a principal here at OUP on the tech side. My background is in electrical engineering. I have a PhD in uh, physics. Uh, I was a former academic at Cambridge in the UK in condensed matter physics. Uh, then moved into the semiconductor world for a while and uh, be became an investor after an MBA. I've been investing for the past six or seven years or so. Yeah. Harry. That's it. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Harry Wan. I'm an associate on the life science team at OUP. I'm a scientist by training. I did a PhD in microbiology at Harvard. Uh, and during that time, I spent about a year as an intern with Vita Ventures and flagship pioneering. So joined the team at OUP about a year ago. Great. Nabil. Hi, everyone. Nabil Ula. I've been at OUP for uh, about three years now. I'm a senior analyst. I spend my time split also, um, sitting on the tech and physical sciences team with me. Uh, but also as OUP's data analyst. So a lot of the content you see um, is, is created by none other than yours truly. Uh, <laughs> prior to OUP, I spent uh, two years at Goldman Sachs as a financial mm -hmm. analyst, and my background is in finance and mechanical engineering. Great. Thank you all. So glad to have you here today and for putting this uh, terrific presentation together that we'll be going over today. We'll go to the next slide. The slides and a recording of this webinar will be available on OUP's partner portal, and a recording will also be publicly available um, on our YouTube channel. The partner portal is an online portal for the technology transfer, transfer officers and researchers at our partner universities that's full of relevant tech transfer and startup content. Once you're in the portal, which you will need to register if you have not already, you'll find a downloadable presentation deck and video link for this webinar on the webinars page. <laughs> pretty obvious there, which is under our startup resources section. But as I mentioned, this will also be on our YouTube channel, which is where most people end up watching the recordings of our webinars. We do encourage questions throughout our webinar. Please use the Q&A tool uh, in Zoom to ask your questions. Please don't use the chat. They're much harder for me to keep track of. And I'll be moderating uh, and watching for those questions and asking them of our panelists as we go along here. We uh, will follow up with links uh, about this webinar to everyone who registered uh, within about a week. We do have upcoming webinars as well that may be of interest to you. We have one coming up on March 28th uh, for Empowering Women Innovators, a spotlight on the National Science Foundation's i program. We also have another one that we haven't actually quite put on here uh, yet, but you should be coming through to you soon. That will be um, the use of A and technology commercialization efforts. So uh, be on the watch out for that one coming up uh, in the near future as well. We can go to the next slide. A short intro on OUP. For those of you who don't know us, we're a venture capital fund that partners with academic institutions to invest in their startups, typically by exercising the participation rights available through their licenses. As a part of this partnership, the institutions share in our profits and receive programmatic support on tech transfer and academic startups. We're now on our fourth fund, and we've made over 130 investments in all areas of deep science, and many of those companies have had successful exits, either through IPOs or merger and acquisition. The next slide then shows some of our portfolio companies and the breadth of areas we invest in. We're always happy to talk about our model, so please feel free to reach out to any of us who are on this uh, webinar right now afterwards if you have any questions about our model. We'll go to the next slide. Um, this slide shows our agenda for today. We're going to talk about the state of the fundraising environment, then go through our typical life science trends, um, which a lot of that data comes from uh, the Silicon Valley Bank healthcare report. We're really thankful for that every year. Uh, we'll go through the tech trends. A lot of that information comes from PitchBook and other sources. Then we have some teasers for some upcoming content that we're going to have uh, a particular uh, we're going to do some industry-focused uh, uh, area webinars this year, so we're going to be talking about some of those areas, and then we'll have a wrap-up. And with that, I'm going to pass the baton over to Nabil to start us off here. Again, if you end up having any questions as we're going through these slides today, please do just ask them in the Q&A uh, tool, and I'll make sure our panelists get to them. Nabil. Thank you, Kirsten. Um, next slide. So uh, to kick things off, I wanted to present, um, you know, what I think are the three biggest characteristics that kind of defined 
what 2023 looked like for venture. Um, and I'll start by acknowledging what's obvious. I, I think we all know that things were slow, um, you know, in terms of both deal pace and deal value. Uh, and me and Harry are going to drill down into the details of that for both tech and life science broadly, as well as for the university subset later on in the presentation. So I won't spend a ton of time on this fact alone, except just perhaps uh, put into perspective the magnitude of these slowdowns. Um, and how it put overall venture funding down over 50% from its 2021 peak. Uh, and, and so that brings me to my next point. And so oh, despite overall declines, there's a record amount of venture dollars sitting on the sidelines, uh, over $300 billion, in, in fact. And, and $67 billion of this was raised in 2023, uh, which is slower historically, but still in line with pre-pandemic levels. Uh, and so it's also worth noting that established managers, uh, established fund managers captured more than 75% of those dollars, uh, leaving less for inaugural funds. Um, and so all that capital sitting around, what are investors doing with it? Um, well, they're probably hoping that their patience is going to pay off. Um, investors are prioritizing their existing portfolio companies, uh, and they're taking time to conduct diligence uh, on new opportunities. And so we expect slower capital deployment. To, to continue to be a theme uh, into 2024 as well. And so the last point here is, um, you know, what does the combination of venture declines and record dry powder mean when you put it in the context of uh, what seems like the start of a public bull market? Uh, the S&P 500 returned 24% last year uh, and has gained another 7 or 8% this year. And I know it may seem odd to be talking about public markets in a webinar about venture capital, but I promise it's related. So private market behavior often lags the public markets. And so it can almost be a crystal ball for alternative assets. Uh, and so the recovery on the public side could potentially signal uh, a similar fate on the private side in the longer term. And as for what's behind the public market rally, um, you know, I think we can all agree that AI has been a standout driving force. Uh, and by pushing the public markets towards stability, uh, we might even see the IPO gates unlock again as a byproduct of that. Next slide. So I wanna spend these next two slides unpacking the two last points I made, uh, one about dry powder, one about optimism. Um, and so on the left, on the, on the life science side, healthcare focused funds raised $19 billion in 2023. Um, and that's a 14% year-over-year decline, but still the third highest annual total ever. Uh, and that's trailing behind, you guessed it, 2021 and 2022. And so the point is that LPs are still allocating to life sciences. And so I had mentioned that about 25% of the new VC funds raised in 2023 um, were inaugural funds. Uh, and a good number of those actually popped up on the life science side. Goldman Sachs raised its first life science fund uh, for investments across therapeutics, tools, and diagnostics. Uh, and then we've got firms like Curie and Scion focusing on company formation. And so I think these new funds display sort of a bifurcation of risk uh, where investors are seeking shelter from the current market by either being involved very, very early in company creation and hoping for better markets down the road or investing in companies that are further along in the clinic um, to get to an exit more quickly. Uh, the difficulty for startups is that if you exist in the middle of that plane, uh, it's very hard to get funded. And so on the tech side, uh, it's very much a sector-driven story. Uh, while fundraising has been a bit more challenged um, for tech VCs, uh, AI has created billions in opportunity for funds like Andreessen and IBM. And while we know that AI has been the hottest space of late, uh, climate tech has also continued to garner attention uh, from investors with Breakthrough Energy targeting another $1 billion uh, in a new fund, and then At One Ventures closing $375 million for climate. Um, even RA Capital uh, came out with a planetary health fund uh, in 2023. And so all of this to say that despite a slowdown, uh, new investors and existing investors alike uh, are gearing up to find opportunities in this environment even if it may take a little bit longer. Next slide. And so speaking of things taking a little bit longer, uh, the IPO market fought a little bit in 2023, 
uh, but companies are still staying private for longer before going public. Um, so the, the chart on the left shows a backlog of IPOs in biotech. The green bar represents the number of new likely to IPO companies. And then the light green area graph in the background represents the percentage of those likely to IPO companies that remain private. Uh, the point of the graph is that 80% of the biotechs that did their last deal before an IPO in the second half of 2021 are still actually private. Uh, in fact, over 80% of the biotech IPOs in 2023 um, were, were phase two or later, and then there were no, no preclinical uh, IPOs at all. Uh, and to give some context, 26% of all biotech IPOs in 2021 were preclinical. Uh, and so clearly, you know, investors are looking for more de-risked opportunities. And so IPOs continue to be reserved for the companies with more robust fundamentals. And in biotech, that means uh, being further along in the clinic. And so what about on the tech side? Uh, it's a similar story, uh, just on the tech side, robust fundamentals uh, translates to meaningful revenue or even profitability. Um, the tech IPO markets actually saw a little bit of a glimmer of hope in Q3 of 2023 um, with the IPOs of Instacart and Clavio. The combination of those two actually uh, propped up exit values for the quarter to the highest level seen since Q4 2021. Uh, but in the end, 2023 exit activity still closed at a decade low. Um, so pr probably the most interesting thing about those two companies, though, is that they were actually profitable when they went public, uh, which is a rare event for venture-backed tech companies. Uh, and so despite profitability, uh, both companies still took a haircut on valuation and post-IPO performance has been lackluster. Um, you know, so why do I mention this? You know, if we think there's some hope on the horizon, well, you know, the chart on the right hand side shows investors who hold the most potential tech IPO candidates in their portfolio along with a few notable companies on the right mm -hmm. that I'm sure many of us recognize. Um, we know that the bar is set high, uh, but it is not a matter of if, but when, you know, the IPO, the gates open again. And, and there's a flood of companies that will hit the market and it could spark the turnaround we need to breathe life into exit activity again. And so, uh, and, and that goes for both the tech side and the life science side. And um, on that note, uh, my colleague, Harry, is going to lead us into a discussion on the life science side uh, about last year's trends and dive a little bit deeper into some of the, the broader strokes that I made. We actually, just one question before that, if we can go quickly back to the last slide. It is a clarification question, uh, Nabil. Uh, what is an LIPO deal? Yeah, uh, LIPO stands for likely to IPO. Um, these are the companies that are closest to an IPO and uh, we the, the the latest uh, private deal that they had is assumed to be the last private deal they will have before an IPO. Excellent. Thank yeah. you so much. All right. Sorry about that, Harry. Transitioning over to you. No, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nabil and, and Kirsten. So to, let's uh, dive right into last year's trends on life science side. Next slide, please. And so I, th I think unsurprisingly to anyone that's that's been in, in the life science sector and, and really across sectors is, you know, uh, investment, VC investment, uh, in this space is down from the euphoric highs of 2021. Uh, you know, I, I think, you know, this is what we see is a plot here of VC dollars and the colored bars broken down by sector. Uh, and then the dark blue line measuring deal count uh, over time. And and I, I, yeah, I think everyone can feel it, but then the data supports it, right? That VC investment is down from, you know, you know substantially, right? From the, you know, the over exuberance uh, in, in the, you know, immediately during the pandemic times. You know, I think year over year, if you look at these different sectors, you know, down 25 percent, you know, 42 percent steeply, you know, in, in diagnostics and tools. You know, I, I think the the point of optimism or the silver lining is that, you know, notably, you know, we've seen this contraction. Uh, but if you take the historical perspective and look back a little bit further, uh, you know, 2018, 2019, you know, we haven't gone down below those levels. And so, you know, what we haven't seen is is a total flight of uh VC investment from the sector entirely, uh, you know, and it's just more of a normalization uh, from a, a total outlier time. Uh, next slide, please. 
And so focusing now, what we'll do is like dive into each of these sectors, uh, specifically starting in therapeutics. And so in the, the universe of, of therapeutics deals and venture investments, you know, what we've done is uh, the data from SVB is broken out, you know, total dollars and deals on, on the right over the past uh, four years, uh, and then uh, subsetted out the seed and series A dollars. And so, you know, what we might think is that, you know, with this uh, depression, you know, in, in the biotech markets, you know, that you would have this total flight in therapeutics from these early stage, you know, and in fact, if we do next, please. Uh, what we see is as a percent of total dollars, uh, these seed and series A uh, investments have stayed relatively flat, uh, you know, over the, the past few years. So 23, 22 percent. Uh, and, you know, I think what this reflects is that this there's this continued appetite on investors part uh, for these or, you know, even these seed series A deals, you know, perhaps that's due to, you know, being able to shield and be macro shielded uh, where you invest early enough that, you know, you hope for uh, a better, you know, biotech market to, to emerge and, and weather the storm. If we go next slide, please. And so then now going, uh, focusing in, on the universe, uh, the universe of university startups uh, in therapeutics, what we see is that, you know, deal count has come down dramatically since 2021. Uh, you know, despite that, you know, the uh, total amount of capital deployed, while yes, down from 21, uh, is actually even rebounded slightly from 22 and, and remains high. You know, I think what this reflects is that while deal counts are low uh, and dollars put to work, uh, stay flat, you know, you, you're having more dollars be put in, more in, more capital invested into fewer companies. And, and so, you know, I think the paint, picture that this paints is a story of haves and have nots. And I think we can really see that in valuation. And so if you take a look at the deal pace, the slower deal pace in 23, certainly compared to 21, uh, look, taking the top quartile of these of, of valuations, the companies that took the top quartile in valuation, uh, we see that there's an uptick even from 21. You know, these, these top quartile valuations grew 15% year over year. You know, what this really highlights is that there were, you know, these companies that are at the top, they're able to still demand a slight premium. And so some of the companies with these uh, these uh, large early stage deals highlighted here. But again, this, this picture of these companies that there are companies still able to raise, they're able to get uh, high valuations. Uh, but they're, you know, in that universe, there are many companies that are still not able to get that raise, to get that deal done. Uh, next slide, please. And so then going even earlier to first time financings in university therapeutics. And, and so looking at seed and angel deals, and we'll focus on the seed deals. You know, again, for the second year in a row, seed deal pace slowed down, you know, and, and overall funding this, this year dropped for the first time in over a decade. Uh, or in about a decade. And, and so what we see is that, again, deal count is lower. Uh, and so the capital invested is dropping not to the same level. And so you have more com or fewer companies getting slightly more capital, a larger share of that capital, uh, you know, reflected again in the seed uh, in the seed investments. You know, I think we can look to the angel data. I think an important caveat is that, you know, these are angel rounds that are disclosed to pitch book. And so that doesn't capture the full universe of, of angel deals. But I think the, the trends are more important than the absolute numbers. And what we're seeing is that fewer of these deals get done, you know, certainly compared to, you know, historical, historical angel deals done. And so, you know, maybe reflecting, you know, a flight of, you know, a, a typical angel investor, you know, from the space. And so, you know, whereas, you know, you might have had uh, specialists uh, that that angel invest stay in the sector, uh, perhaps generalist angel investors uh, leaving uh, as, as the markets continue to worsen. Uh, next slide, please. So you know, pivoting now to looking at devices, I think we're looking at the similar slide. We're parting out total dollars and deals done uh, in in the device space, and then also looking at these early stage series seed and series A. And you know, in contrast to therapeutics, uh, next please, uh, what we see is that um, you know this has contracted. You know, the, the, these early stage investments have had a contraction uh, compared to prior years. So from fourteen percent of total dollars uh, down to eleven percent in twenty two and twenty three. And, you know, this reflecting this investor shift from early stage deals in devices 
uh, to these later stage. And, you know, I think reflects well with the very few uh, device deals that we do as a firm. It, you know, I think um, matches to is a sentiment that we've seen across the board uh, from other investors is that, you know, unfortunately with devices, you know, you just don't get uh, the, the risk that you have uh, being primarily in commercialization, in clinician willingness to prescribe and payer willingness to reimburse um, a lot of that risk uh, doesn't discharge until much later in the lifetime of these companies. And so as a result, you don't see those valuation step ups uh, along the path that reward the early taking that risk early on. Um, and so, you know, I think reflecting reflected here is that you have that contraction in these earlier stage deals uh, in devices. Uh, next, please. So then taking the focus on the, the universe, uh, uh, university uh, med device deals, you know, we're still historically elevated, right? I think that's the good news and that the capital being put to work in the device space is still, you know, compared to, we'd look back a decade, you know, look to 2014, you know, we, much more capital being put to work, uh, but certainly fewer deals being done. Um, and so, you know, the, whereas the capital put to work has stayed flat to last year, um, the average deal size is what grew as fewer deals were done. So 37% increase year over year uh, in deal size. And, and this is, you know, a record high uh, in, in terms of deal size for devices. You know, what we've seen is, you know, now looking at the median valuation of these companies, you know, is higher even than in 2021. And so I think here what we can take away is that the, uh, though fewer deals are getting done, the ones that are, are able to command that slight premium to valuation just from the fact that uh, a lot of the deals that were done in 2021 would not have happened uh, in, in this market. Um, and so just highlighting a few of these, uh, the largest early stage deals in devices in 2023. Uh, next, please. And so then shifting you know, sectors again to diagnostics and tools, and then looking at these familiar plots of looking at total dollars and deals put to work over the past few years, and then the seed series A dollars, and what we've seen is that, you know, deal pace is, is largely unchanged uh, for early stage and overall. And so we could do next, please. And interestingly, you know, in, con in, in stark contrast to therapeutics and then certainly to devices, uh, we see that, that Series A and C uh, investments are taking a larger percentage of total investments in the space uh, than in 2020, 2021 in the pandemic years. You know, in fact, so if we think, you know, although you have still see a decrease in total investment, uh, it's less steep of a decrease in seed and series A than across the board. Um, and so in seed series A falling only 26% in terms of, of dollars uh, put to work while the broader space fell almost 50. Um, and so perhaps, you know, one of the things that underlies this is, is increasing interest in things like diagnostics, uh, analytics, you know, for firms using, you know, AI driven, you know, and, and benefiting from the AI boom uh, to drive kind of this interest in the earlier diagnostic spaces. Uh, next, please. And so looking at university diagnostic and tools, you know, I, again, I think this is where the deal count and capital invested tracks more uh, more concordantly, where, you know, from 2021, a substantial decrease, you know, in the, the, both the capital put to work and the, the number of deals. Um, and so this is the sector, you know, of the three that we will cover today that suffered the most in 23, uh, with VC funding on 37% from the prior year and over 50% from the 2021 peak. Uh, I think also, you know, keeping in mind, so I, I think a similar a concept as in devices, you know, the number of deals uh, done uh, in, in diagnostics dropped dramatically over the past couple of years, uh, yet valuations, the median valuation increased. Um, and so, again, a, a selection effect where the few deals that are getting done are still of a quality that they can demand a, a higher valuation, even during the uh, boom of 2021. And so some of these deals that that uh, occurred over 2023 uh, will highlight specifically uh, Pre-Seed Biosciences, which is uh, an investment that OUP made out of Fund 4. Uh, next slide, please. And so, you know, finally, to, you know, to wrap up the, the life science section, you know, kind of, kind of touching on some of the most active life sciences investors, you know, over the course of that, that prior year. And so data from Deal Forma and reported at endpoints, and, you know, what we can start out is you see, you know, a few different buckets of investors. So, you know, in these institutional investors where, you know, will invest in, you know, traditional rounds. Um, and, and there's some overlap, you know, with, you know, some of these institutional investors that will also do 
uh, kind of go even early, uh, company creation. And then so firms that will you know, focus on company creation or do a little bit of both of company creation and investing uh, in traditional VC rounds. But, you know, I think, you know, reflecting the, the activity of these company creation firms and including uh, the brand new ones uh, that, that Nabil highlighted at the very beginning, uh, kind of the continued appetite for taking that risk early on uh, and also securing a meaningful amount of equity kind of in exchange. Uh, Additionally, what we also saw, you know, high activity from strategic investors. So groups that, you know, from whether they're uh, affiliated with, you know, the corporate venture arm of a pharma company or uh, groups like uh, Alexandria, you know, in, in real estate, you know, really looking to put capital to work in whether that's for a specific strategic purpose and potential uh, partnerships and, and collaboration down the road or, you know, driving financial returns, you know, in within these larger corporate entities. Uh, these were significant players in, in life science investing over the past year. And so, you know, now we can uh, transition, shift over and pass it over to Ni, who will walk us through some of these tech trends over the past years. Brilliant. Thank you uh, for that, uh, Harry. Uh, I'll just go over uh, the trends that we're seeing on the tech and physical uh, sciences side at the house. Um, next slide, please. So similar to what we see in broader venture, uh, tech investments have mirrored the market. Um, and um, you'll continue to see a variant of sort of this trend similar to what you saw in life sciences throughout this section, uh, perhaps with uh, slight nuances. Um, the headline here in tech is that unsurprisingly, there's been a uh, significant fall in venture activity since the heady days of 2021. Um, but I believe we're perhaps approaching a resumption of normal activity uh, with the total value of deals and the total deal count, uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, matching levels that we saw in 2020. So looking at the trend chart here, uh, it's perhaps arguable that the uh, last year of normalcy, one could say, was about 2020. Uh, and up onto that point, you had a, a steady and largely predictable growth uh, in, in, in deals and deal counts. Uh, but due to a confluence of factors in 2021, some of which have already been mentioned, uh, 2021 is a vastly different year. Um, you know, the, there was, you know, historically low interest rates, which meant that there was a lot of capital chasing higher yields. A lot of it ended up in, in, in venture. Uh, the pandemic inadvertently led uh, a boom in the adoption of more tech and not just more tech, but newer tech. Um, and this was ca characterized by many shortages that we felt during the pandemic. And work from home also led to uh, a, a great boost for software as well. Um, you also had around that time uh, great successes in IPOs and SPACs, which invited more capital and the growth, growth and uh, later stage uh, uh, side of VC, which in aggregate you know, would lead to capital trickling down to uh, earlier stages. And mega funds like SoftBank and uh, uh, Tiger Global were at the peak of their powers. Uh, so in general, there were perhaps a lot of what I would call uh, tourist investors participating in tech deals in the VC world. And all of this foreign, perhaps uh, unsustainable inflow of capital has since reversed, partly due to, but not limited to, uh, the tightening of monetary policy that we've seen um, over the past few quarters, uh, which one could arguably say popped the, bu the bubble in val valuations in, bit in, 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 in tech and was the beginning of the re reversal. Um, there's also a general pe pessimistic economic outlook, which uh, also put the brakes on venture activity. Um, all of which brings us back to my point that, you know, tech activity in 2023 appears to match the last known normal environment in tech. And so I believe that a lot of these effects I've just described um, have mostly worked their way through the system, be it on the boom side or the bust side. Um, and I expect 2024 perhaps to be more similar to 2023, and perhaps for us to begin to see some signs of growth uh, in activity as we enter 2025. Uh, next slide, please. 
So, so that's sort of the the main head, headline for tech, um, um, and the broader tech ecosystem. Um, and as you know, we see here uh, there's also a, a similar trend going for the tech for the university space uh, in tech deals. So there was a boom in 2021, there was a bust in 2022, and we're potentially seeing the beginning of normalcy in 2023. Um, you'll see here that the 2023 numbers for deal counts and capital invested uh, very closely match what we saw in the university space between 2018 and 2020. Um, so in 2023, we, we saw some big rounds uh, for some sought after uh, spin outs like in Fabrica and Celestial. Uh, and these rounds, on average, you know, were funded funding rounds of over 100 million. So there's, there's some activity sort of starting to come back. Um, but um, in, in general, we still have, have a, uh, a, a depressed atmosphere in tech. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of first time financing, uh, there's still some challenges that are being faced um, in this field. And you know, some of you in, in the audience might be feeling it anecdotally in terms of what, what you're seeing in your respective roles. Um, whilst the total fund raise is very strong, in fact, we see uh, a record high in our data, deal pace is rather sluggish. Um, the, the picture here is a bit murky, uh, and I, I think Harry pro provided some explanations on the life science side of things. Um, my working theory here on the tech side is that perhaps academics um, that have been harboring ideas that they de developed over the past few years took advantage of the heady days of 2021 and pushed out a lot of their ideas. Um, and so as, as a result, there's sort of a, a, a compressed timeline within, you know, the 2021 period that where ideas that would otherwise have been incubated for a few more years were pushed out early uh, and, and, and uh, were able to gain the, the greater access to capital that was available at that time. Uh, and now there's just a lack of, you know, innovative ideas in the pipeline being commercialized. So, you know, I, I think the different takes to that, but that's that's sort of my working theory that, you know, lots of companies got pushed out because it was a good time to fundraise. And it's just going to take a while for that to for, for the innovation pipeline to be reloaded with more companies uh, to be spun out. Uh, next, next slide, please. We also notice in terms of uh, fundraising for physical scientists and software, uh, we, we also notice that uh, physical scientists have seen a very slightly worse decline in software. Um, and note that this data set is for all stages, so both early and late. Uh, deal sizes in early stages remain robust and growing, uh, while there's perhaps less ap appetite uh, for larger late stage deals. So the, the drop in the size of late stage deals uh, should perhaps be taken with a, a pinch of salt here. This is because we're seeing, especially on the late stage side, uh, lots of bridge rounds, um, which generally tend to be smaller rounds and uh, are not sort of full proper rounds and gen generally financed by insiders. Uh, so the story here is that these later stage companies um, which are overvalued because, you know, they race in the high valuation era of 20, 2021, um, instead of taking down rounds, are uh, essentially raising smaller and sort of friendlier rounds with, with insiders uh, in order to protect the va valuation in the hope of raising in future, uh, uh, in the future when the market rebounds. So that could account for this sort of dip that we're seeing on the late stage side, whilst um, on the early stage side, things are just stead steadily growing in terms of deal size. Um, next slide, please. So we also wanted to break out climate funding in the university space. Um, there's not much to add here, sort of follows the general trend. One thing to note is that 
uh, uh, is, is that climate is a more sort of recent force in the uh, spin out ecosystem. And university spin outs accounted for 20% of all VC dollars going into this industry. So that's that's a very strong showing. And we believe this market share of VC dollars will continue uh, uh, to be sustained uh, for climate change spin outs. Um, next slide, please. And, uh, and finally, uh, these were the most active investors in the university spin-out space in 2023. Um, in general, this, this space contains a very active and growing group. Um, I particularly noticed more interest in university spin-outs from general VCs that I speak to. Um, we at OEP are always trying to connect our um, uh, connect startups in the university ecosystem to broader investors that we know in the broader uh, VC investor base. Um, and, you know, we think interest in, in spin outs will continue to grow um, within, within the general VC world. Uh, next. Right. We do have a quick question before we get to the next section. Um, and this actually, I think is a good question for you considering what you were talking about with the markets. Um, it, it, this question is about um, inflation and it, it is whether the um, increased deal size is affected by the compound effects of inf inflation. Have you seen inflation and the delay of interest rate cuts affect angel and BC investment activity? I, I don't particularly see um the impact there right because um in the broader macroeconomic system a lot of the inflation in in the real mar market sort of happened way before now we're sort of dealing with the after effects of it uh and monetary policy in general was was lagged massively the effects of inflation so i don't think in 2023 what we're seeing in, in 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 terms of deal size is inflation related for example maybe startups are spending more on equipment and what and whatnot um I, I'm, I'm sure there's some effect there but i'm not entirely sure that's really what we're seeing i think what we're seeing is companies um that are good of good qual quality going out to raise and being able to soak up um the dollars that are available in the market so deals are able to be done um are are raising more money than than uh than other than otherwise that would be my uh okay that's to what's happening with uh with respect to inflation and i could yeah try to get there on, on the life sciences side you, you know i i think largely you know thinking about like monetary policy and and, and rates you know I, I think the bigger impact is going to be on uh, like VC funds going out to raise capital, right? And, and so, you know, like how, you know, LPs will, will allocate, you know, maybe impacted, you know, by that, by that, that broader monetary policy. Uh, as far as inflation goes, you know, I think uh, I, I agree with Nee in, in that li likely the deal size shifts we've seen, I think is not driven primarily by inflation, uh, but where I think it might have an impact is where you have, you know, portfolio companies that have, you know, they raised capital on on a certain you know uh, idea of, of what their budgeting was going to be. It, you know, if that changes meaningfully, uh, in addition to things always taking longer and costing more than you budget out for anyway, uh, you know, may you know play a part in where you see the need to uh, have a bridge or extension round uh, to to sort of get to the milestones that you were looking to reach by the time you went out to raise the next large uh, VC round. All good points. Yes. Um, I'm going to have another question for you, Ni. Uh, any thoughts as to why university climate tech spinouts be, are being allo allocated uh, such a larger portion of VC capital investment versus other tech areas? Ni. Um, good question. I, I don't think I have a super clear answer for, for that. I think a lot of the innovation we're seeing in climate science um or, or sort of climate tech sorry is highly scientifically driven innovation uh and as a result the, the very few places this sort of 
you know, high degree of research can come from. So I think that that's what potentially accounts for a, a, a super high share because, um, you know, climate science is mostly found within un universities. So, you know, that that would be my guess. Great. Thank you, Ni. Uh, another question about um, are, what are, are we seeing uh, investments in sustainable packaging in particular? Ni, have you seen anything in those areas? Yeah, I, I, I have. I think in the past few months, I've seen um, uh, maybe three or so of them. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if they're really becoming a trend. I think this is something that would have been hotter perhaps a couple of years ago. Uh, so it's, it's probably more cooling down than it is accelerating. Okay, thank you. And then the next question I think is for Nabil, and I'm not sure we could answer this, but maybe something that uh, we could look into. It's a, do you have any data on investors doing deals in university startups showing the largest changes in 2023 university startup invest, investing positive, both positive, positively and negatively, basically who is getting in and getting um, out in university startup investing? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Um, I, I don't have the data top of mind to answer. I will say um, we report out on the active investors in the university space year over year. So, um, you know, if you look at last year's logos versus this year's logos, there I know there's definitely a difference because as, as the person, you know, preparing the data, I noticed a lot of those investors um, who were coming in in the past um, weren't necessarily um, very active in, in the last year. Um, and that could be due to a number of reasons. Um, you know, I think in some of the previous exuberance that we've seen, um, a lot of investors who maybe shouldn't be investing in certain areas were. Um, and, um, you know, maybe maybe we're 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 coming back to to earth now, and 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 more of like the more of the the regular typical investors you would expect to see are now, um, you know, re remaining in, in the space. Um, all that to say, um, can definitely uh, double check and and follow up specifically on you know who those investors might be and what the differences might be. Yes, right, and we know who's answer asking this particular question to Bill, so we can uh, follow up on that yeah, as well. Great. So, um, a couple more questions, but we will get to the the teasers for um, upcoming webinars that we're planning on certain investment areas after that. Uh, so this one uh, is for you, Harry, uh, for the life science investments. Were there any technical space? Was there any technical space in particular that has suffered a decline in investments, or was the decline spread out over all various technology spaces? Spaces, for example, they ask about cancer, uh, whether that's still strong, or there's, there have been other decline areas. So, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's a great question, and and in fact, you know, I what we actually have seen is that you know very much uh, sector specific declines, and so it's interesting. Uh, that, that cancer was, was specifically, you know, brought up. You know, I think for a long time we've seen uh, oncology suck up a lot of the oxygen in the room, and just in terms of like, you know, gaining a, a investment dollars and, and and capital put to work. What we've seen, you know, kind of the trend has been, you know, over you know the past uh, year and and maybe you know two two years or so is that you know preclinical oncology and especially like immuno oncology uh, has just been really really difficult for VC investors to get excited about. Uh, I think. Inverse to that, uh, I, I think speaking to kind of the uh, quick changing tides of like things that are in vogue and out of vogue, um, there's been a lot of interest and excitement around uh, INI, so so uh, autoimmunity uh, indications uh, and finding you know drugs for for the in that space. Um, obesity is a great example uh, as a space that was very very difficult to get uh, VC dollars in just a couple of years ago, and now is just exploding in interest, and so. You know, a lot of this is driven by um, exit potential. So, you know, can we, do we feel or do we believe that uh, a pharma is going to be interested enough to do a deal, M&A, uh, an, uh, an exit uh, transaction, essentially? Um, but but also, you know, I mean, I think, you know, we always joke that, you know, there's like this lemming behavior among VCs, but I, I think in life sciences, there is a rationale to it, right? And, you know, with a lot of these companies in, in specific uh, indication areas, um, especially things like cell therapy, I, the amount of capital necessary uh, to get these companies to adequately finance these companies to a real exit um, is extraordinarily difficult. It, it's, it's, high, it's a high amount of capital. And so I think you need to be investing in spaces where you feel like there are 
uh, colleagues, you know, it, you know, in the in the VC community that will, you know, go along with you for the ride, uh, and, and also, you know, you, you'll be able to raise the successive rounds that it takes to make these companies successful. Well, and that answer would be almost the perfect lead into your next slide, Harry. But <laughs> I do have this other question that I want to fit in before we go to there. Um, do you see any hesitation in investment activity due to regulatory uncertainty in an election year? So I think a very interesting question. Um, Harry, I think this really is a question to you, but are we seeing any uh, hesitancy in investment activity? Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I think it's a really great question, right? I mean, I think there's been so much regulatory uncertainty around, you know, IRA and, and the impacts that that's had on drug development, you know, and I think it's, it's an open discussion, right, is that, you know, we've seen, you know, um, Pfizer saying, hey, it's not going to, you know, impact our bottom line all that much, but, you know, also, on the other hand, seeing, you know, pharma companies uh, explicitly, you know, um, deprioritize uh, specific, whether it's a specific program or expansion to a specific indication uh, because of the knock-on effects of the IRA, right? And and thinking about the impacts on exclusivity for small molecules and uh, how the, the uh, provisions in place uh, impact um, you know, whether it makes sense to really invest in, in, in small molecule if the exclusivity is so hampered, uh, which is really, you know, I, I think counterintuitive because small molecules are the easiest to make generics of, right? Um, and so I, I guess circling back to the question on, you know, has this, you know, hesitate, you know, increased maybe hesitance in investment activity? I think it's an area that, you know, we're all actively looking at and, and thinking really hard on, like how, how this uh, changes. Um, you know, a space or um, an indication that we we might actively go after. You know, I, I would say it's not so cut and dry uh, mm -hmm. where it's not, oh, we will not do a small molecule investment now because of the IRA. Um, and, and certainly, right, you know, and you you know, brings these things to the fore. I, I think a lot of the things you'll see in the news, it, you know, it's hard to parse whether it's um, posturing for an election year or if it reflects genuine policy that comes down and that will impact uh, innovation and, and drug development. So, so I think these are all things that, that we're thinking about, but I would say not um, dogmatically driving our investment activities. Great, thanks. With that, Harry, I will hand it back to you to go through um, uh, the teasers then. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, happy to dive in. And yeah, I think upcoming content, you know, upcoming webinars that we might do deep dives on. I think this was uh, an exciting place to highlight things that we're interested in and, and and spaces that we're seeing, you know, come actively to the fore. You know, I think obesity, as I mentioned, you know, this is a really great example of this. And, you know, where has the change been where a couple of years ago, you really couldn't get investment in the space uh, to now where it's just exploded. And so the Incretin therapeutics, the GLP-1 therapeutics that, you know, I'm sure we're all very familiar with, you know, these have transformed the treatment of obesity, you know, where we've seen for uh, trizepatide, uh, Lily's GLP-1, um, 20% weight loss at 72 weeks. Uh, and, you know, importantly, you know, addressing the question of whether payers will be excited about reimbursing for obesity. What we've seen is that, you know, in the select trial that, that Novo ran, you know, a 23% reduction in the risk of death due to major cardiovascular events uh, over a period of 40 months. And so really demonstrating that, you know, these drugs are effective uh, and they have an, uh, also have an impact on other uh, health outcomes and specifically cardiovascular. And so while this is great and has, has driven the, you know, the market caps of both Lilly and Novo sky high, you know, there are issues with these drugs that drive continued innovation or, you know, areas that, you know, the, the reason why innovation in this space has been exploding, you know, and that's, you know, with the glip ones, you know, you see this discontinuation in patients due to nausea and vomiting. Um, you know, you have, it, it's an injectable format, you know, and so it's inconvenient for, for a lot of patients. Um, you know, there are drugs available that are oral, you know, um, one, you know, Rivelsis, uh, from Novo, but then others in development. But, you know, I think really going oral is, is you know, and, and what you do is you sacrifice efficacy uh, is what we've seen uh, to date. And so ways that, you know, kind of get around this issue where you can get a convenient format while not sacrificing efficacy will be important. And then also this issue of lean muscle mass loss that's been observed. And so, you know, looking for mechanisms of actions that will address this issue and, and be able to achieve the fat selective uh, weight loss uh, that that will, you know, it would really be a profile of a differentiated therapeutic. And I think, you know, I hinted at it earlier, but, you know, kind of what drives um, VC investment in this space 
is exit potential is, is one of those aspects. And so, you know, being able to see robust M&A uh, activity from both the front runners, uh, Lily and, and Novo, looking to kind of um, steady their uh, position at, at, the, at the front of the pack, uh, but also new players, so pharmas that that want to get in the space and, and see a, a ton of value to be created there. And so just highlighting three of these transactions that occurred uh, last year um, from from the from different pharmas look, looking to um, you know expand expand their their technological uh, ability you know with, with products. It, driving that, you know, or that as a driver of the private and public investor sentiment, which has remained strong, right? And so, you know, out of OUP4, you know, one of our recent investments was in BioAge, which had a uh, oversubscribed $170 million round uh, that, that was announced uh, earlier this year. Uh, and so uh, uh, looking to develop a therapeutic that, that will, uh, you know, help address some of those issues with the glip ones and make the glip ones better. Uh, the other question, other you know, companies that we wanted to highlight are public companies. So Viking Therapeutics, where you have a, um, you know, we had this company that you know released new clinical data and showing that they can achieve weight loss uh, at a much earlier time point uh, compared to Terzepatide. So that same level of weight loss earlier. Um, this company, like the the stock, was up three hundred fifty percent on the news, right? And Viking announced a public offering. Uh, on uh, around that data where they're targeting 350 more million dollars coming into the company. And so we see, you know, a healthy market cap for this company and also for structure, right? A, a different company developing an oral GLP-1 uh, that's in phase two clinical trials, a healthy market cap for this company as well. And so I think we'll continue to see active uh, development and investment uh, and certainly interest in, in this space. Next slide, please. Right. Uh, so this this is regarding tech and specifically pho photonics. So photonics is a growing field uh, of the past few years, uh, with over three billion dollars being poured into startups uh, in this space in recent years. Uh, a sizable amount of this capital has gone to university spinouts like iLabs and Light Matter. Uh, and, and pretty much all the action in photonics is happening around the data center. Um, so within the data center, there, there's sort of three broad actions that one can perform. Um, two of them are active actions and one of those passive actions. So um, with, within a data center, you can sort of either compute data and that's in some sort of computation device like a CPU, a GPU, an FPGA, or an, or an ASIC. Uh, you can transmit date, date, data, or you can store it. So those are essentially the three main things you can do. Um, obviously, storing is a passive action, and compute and transmit is more of an active action. Uh, with the growth in AI and ML, there's just way more data than ever before uh, to be serviced in a data set center. Um, that is, there's just more data to be computed and after that to be transmitted and after that to be stored. Uh, so speed is incredibly important, um, essentially for you know, the active actions like compute and transmit. Um, and that's where photonics is making a huge difference in bringing us into a new era of information technology. So here on this slide, I have a, a basic schematic of what it looks like in a, in a data center. You, you've got a compute plane where data is processed. So, you know, within the compute plane, you have the likes of the GPUs and C, CPUs, and then you have the networking plane, which is responsible for moving data within the data center and also between the data center and the outside world. And we have innovations like co-package optics being brought into the compute plane in order to compute data faster. Um, and you also have things like um, photonic computation, where data is being processed using light and photons instead of electrons. Uh, and, and these are trying to sort of make inroads in the compute plane within a data center. And in the networking plane, you have innovations in silicon photonics. Uh, so just having more photonic elements in semiconductor production and, and, and CMOS production. Uh, and this is propelling us to the next gen um, optical transceivers and interconnect that should make transmit actions within the data center much, much faster. 
So everyone is working on this, both the old guard, and that's the usual suspects I have li listed here, and, um, and highly innovative new entrants. Um, so much so that last year, OUP led a seed round in one of these companies. Uh, uh, it's a UC, UCSB startup called Quintessent. Um, we hope this company will be a game changer in chip to chip communication, especially in the compute plane. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a very exciting field. Uh, stay tuned for more on Photonics. Yeah, great. And then another space that, that we've been interested in and, and has seen like uh, more growth in has been in women's health. And so, you know, while also do, you know, like we've seen the space has been one that's been underinvested historically. And, you know, while yes, due to structural health disparities, regulatory risk is another aspect that's driven this. And with general FDA guidance to exclude pregnant women from trials. And, you know, it has been noted that this lack of regulatory support, you know, has slowed therapeutic development in this population. And so, you know, focusing, zooming in on preeclampsia as a specific indication, you know, we've seen technological advances that catalyze interest. And, and so, you know, with the a diagnostic test that was approved for preeclampsia, you know, really, you know, lessen some of the hurdles that we see uh, for developing therapeutics uh, then for, for preeclampsia. And so there was a, a large oversubscribed round that was announced early this year with Comanche Biopharma, a company that's looking to develop um, a therapeutic for preeclampsia. And we've seen investment in women's health grow, right? So looking at women's health since 2018, 300 14% uh, uh, of 2018 levels, whereas all healthcare stayed relatively fat, flat. I think it's also important, to, uh, finally, to note that women's health, you know, is, you know, the, the areas of focus are, you know, much greater than just reproductive, you know, fertility, pregnancy-related indications. And we've also seen strong investment in this space as well. So 435 million invested into non-reproductive companies, uh, but women's health non-reproductive companies in Q323, uh, making it a single quarter record. Uh, next, please. Great. Thanks, Harry. Um, so as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, um, you know, climate tech was particularly resilient in 2023 um, and even saw some new funds pop up dedicated to the space. Uh, and so one of the biggest areas of climate tech is energy storage. Uh, and one could argue it's quite a crowded space, but I think when you take a step back, it's really because there are so many different scientific approaches to take in the space. Uh, and so this, this slide attempts to break out those various types of technologies within energy storage. Um, and so, you know, if you haven't ever looked at any of Climate Tech VC's resources, I, I highly recommend it. Um, this, this market landscape was also made by them. It's an incredible resource. Um, and so, you know, I won't go through and read each of these technologies to you, um, but the, the point I want to make is that, you know, a lot of companies are playing in these spaces and um, these areas can be incredibly capital intensive. And, and that's noted in some of the figures you see here for some of the prolific companies that I've, um, you know, called out here. So, for example, in the thermal space, you know, Antora raising, you know, upwards of $230 million and Malta raising over $100 million. And then, you know, we've got companies like Form Energy who have raised nearly $1 billion. Um, and so um, for, you know, investors looking at the space, you know, it's, it's important to note that these are very, um, you know, very cap operationally intensive businesses and um, very, they, they can be very dilutive as well. So it's something to consider. Um, and, and just to make a, a last point on, on the slide itself, you know, what you're seeing here on the x-axis is the duration of energy storage. Um, and laid out on top of that are the different types of technologies and where they fit in in terms of um, in terms of the duration of energy storage. And so long duration energy storage kind of plays in the eight to thirty hour mark. That's typically the sweet spot for long duration energy storage, um, just because of the unit economics of it. And um, you know, because this is a teaser, you know, I will. Um, end it there and say that, you know, more to come and more details to come on that um, in the in the actual webinar that we decide to do. Next slide. All right. Um, so I could almost just leave the slide here and not even say anything because uh, I feel like everyone sees AI all around us everywhere these days. Um, but it's worth putting um, numbers to the anecdotal hype that we see and feel every day. Uh, and so 
the chart on the right is showing uh, the Google search trend, the, the Google interest over time in the search phrase AI since January 2022. Uh, and overlaid on top of that is when, you know, ChatGPT blew up. Um, and then that paved the way for some of 2023's most prolific AI deals in companies like OpenAI, Anthropic, Inflection, Mistral. Um, and so generative AI deal value skyrocketed in 2023 with 24 billion flowing into the space through 389 deals. And that's up from just 4 billion the prior year. Uh, and so what this translates to is, is pretty amazing. One, $1 in every $3 invested in VC went into AI companies. Uh, and those AI companies represented roughly 20% of the total VC deals in 2023. And what's even more staggering uh, is that OpenAI and Anthropic alone <laughs> represented 10% of 2023's entire VC deal value. Uh, so they're definitely outliers, um, but they're driving the market. And so in a market where you know public tech multiples were compressed and performance was just not super noteworthy, you know, AI has emerged as one of the, the new darlings of VC and potentially a new darling of Wall Street once these companies actually start going public. Um, and, you know, I'm also happy to say that OUP4 has just closed an investment in an AI startup as well. Uh, the deal is still unannounced, so more details to come, uh, but we're excited to have made uh, an impactful investment in a hot space there as well. Great. Thank you, Nabil. We are at the end of our um, time for this webinar. We do have a couple of questions. We are going to stay on for a little bit uh, to answer those particular questions. So they'll be recorded. People can see them in the recording afterwards, since I know some people have to leave. Please do. Um, we uh, uh, Katie had put um, the survey in our chat. Also, as you lead the webinar, you'll see a link to our survey. Please do answer it. It'll take you all of 20 seconds. Uh, it really does help us inform us uh, what to do for future webinars. You just saw a glimpse of uh, potential webinars coming up this year from those five different teasers right there. Um, but we really appreciate every, um, every single uh, suggestion that we get because it does help us um, actually produce our future content as well. So with that, I'm going to ask our presenters a couple more questions. Um, all right, uh, and this one actually, I think is mainly to me, but it could be to Nabil as well. Are you seeing any, any uptick, uh, un, sorry, any uptick in early stage investment activity associated with increased government investment in semiconductors via the CHIPS Act? Um, not particularly. I, I have seen a bunch of companies trying to take advantage of, you know, certain bits of the CHIPS Act, but more as an add-on, not, not sort of as a primary reason for spinning out. Um, but I think it's too early to really say for this question, because uh, where the CHIPS Act is really going to be impactful is on ideas that are now being incubated inside a university and, you know, grants that can now be awarded for work that, you know, will take the next two, three, maybe five years to develop and then be spun out into a company. So um, I uh, attended a DARPA conference last year and it, it was super clear there's a lot of money going into helping researchers um, you know, come up with more ideas and, and, and potentially more companies in the future that that can help um, support the aims of the CHIPS Act. So I, I think that's yet to come. But as of right now, um, in terms of what we saw in 2023 and early 2024, not so much and it's too early to tell. Great. Thank you, Mia. And then I'm going to ask um, this last question, which I, I think this is a great last question for each of you. Um, so uh, someone writes in that it was a great insight regarding the current record setting dry powder on unspent cash reserves. Uh, could you please offer two to three actionable steps for early stage founders that they can take uh, to successfully prepare for investor interactions and be prepared to capitalize when the landscape shifts and investment firms begin uh, more actively. They're, not, they're already deploying their capital, but more actively deploying this capital at higher rates. Um, Nabil, maybe I'll start with you since I know that you were already kind of typing in an answer on that, but I'm going to ask this. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think, you know, to put it very simply, and, you know, I'm sure me can echo this, um, just on the tech side, at least, um, I think hunkering down on operational and financial efficiency is probably the biggest key. I think, um, and, and for a, a tech company that's very, very early stage, uh, you know, it could be 
I mean, there could be various sectors that we're talking about, but in general, I think it means um, things like um, trying to build a strong, you know, potential customer pipeline, or at least going out and getting the market feedback, trying to preempt some of the questions you may get from investors um, or reasons for which they might pass on a very, very early round. And you'll often hear things like, oh, like, you know, we want to, we want to see more, uh, we want to hear more about the feedback you get from potential customers. We want to see you hit some of your technical milestones. And so taking the steps to proactively de-risk your technologies earlier on, whether that be through non-dilutive routes um, or through just, um, just sheer grinding and, you know, fit, you know, using every dollar that you have at your disposal to, to advance your ideas. Um, I think, you know, those will set you up for, for success. And, um, you know, I like to say that these days, um, early stage is such a blurry line, you know, you've got seed stage companies that have revenue, and then you've got series A companies that are still ideas. Um, and so I, I think the stage itself is, is a blurry line. And I think what matters more is um, the actual development of the team who's involved, how much you de-risk the technology. Um, and I think um, investors across the plane um, are always looking for those types of things in deciding in, um, you know, what they're going to, what they're going to invest in versus what they're not. Thanks, Neil. Harry? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think Nabil covered a lot of things. I, I think an important, a really important thing, especially in life sciences, where where these you know enterprises are so capital hungry uh, and capital intensive, is, is you know what what exactly what Nabil said around you know like pursuing uh, non dilutive funding. I mean, like these as as critical elements of number one, you don't have to give up equity so early, which is which is a pro, uh, but also you know being able to get to those critically de-risking milestones. And, and, and really, I think it is about weathering the storm. Uh, you know, I think, and then in the interim, you know, uh, finding friendly VCs to get feedback from, you know, I, I think the, the, as, as much as you can uh, refine and shape and tell the story and, and also get that feedback that helps you understand, you know, what are the um, killer experiments or the kind of like the critical things that, that could kill the idea. And, and you know, can you do that early? Such because those are the questions that will be top of mind to every investor that 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 you talk to. And so, to the extent that you can prioritize um, and, and really get the story crisp, clean, clear, um, because at the end of the day, you know, it, it is a storytelling exercise, right? And and, and so, being able to uh, get the idea and what you're building and, and why what you're building is is the best solution to like a really big problem. I think those elements uh, really, um, I think it's a matter of hurdles. And it's like you're, you're competing for uh, the investors like kind of a, a time and attention, right? And, and so to the extent that you can make that story compelling and interesting, um, can get that second look, that's really necessary to sort of get the ball rolling and, and hopefully get a financing together. Thanks, Harini. Right. Uh... Yes, uh, I, I guess I'll echo a lot of what my colleagues uh, have said here. Uh, being capital efficient is pretty important, especially when it's tough for you to raise. Um, you know, I've seen some startups do this quite well in the past uh, few quarters, where it's like you know it's it's tough to raise out there. They're either going to raise very little or just not raise at all, and just you know try and um, and uh, extend their cash runway. Um, so being cap 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 capital efficient until things open up is a uh, uh, very important advice here. Um, to continue to innovate, um, and I think that's the best way to stay alive. You you, you just have to continue to innovate on whatever you're working on, um, and also to show progress. I think gone are the days where in, in investors in some cases might be preempting deals um, and giving startups cash when they didn't, didn't really need it or didn't really show any progress. So now you actually have to hit your mile, your milestones. And if you're sort of in between raises, make sure by the time you need to go out into the market, you have hit substantial progress and milestones that justify um, folks investing in you. Uh, I also say build higher quality teams. That's something that uh, us investors are always looking at. Uh, so it's important to us, but it's even more important to to you and your startup um, in in building a high quality com company. So you know if if you can spare some time to think about how you could improve your team, um, that that's something that would would really show profit when you stand in front of investors uh, to pitch. Um, 
And then finally, you know, trying to show, I think this goes with the progress as well, trying to show some concrete evidence of traction. So showing that the, the market cares about your product. Uh, and quite a lot of times you have uh, entrepreneurs with great ideas, but, you know, they haven't really worked too much on the traction side. You know, it might be a great idea, it might be a great technology, you might even have a great team, um, but there's, there's just not enough effort applied to the does the market care question. And if if you can prove that out a little bit, you'll find that it it, it actually gives you a lot of grace in terms of, well, your technology is not there, but the market really, really cares. So, you know, I'm going to give you the time and the funding in order to, to, to be able to get there. So focusing on that is is also pretty important. Um, so that's that's all I have. Fantastic. And those are all, I think, really great suggestions and a great way to end this particular webinar on how to, on, on the current financing trends and how to weather <laughs> these particular financing trends. So I want to thank our panelists for going through all the very uh, vast information that we had today. We know there was a lot of it. We will be sending out these slides afterwards. You can go through them uh, in more in depth yourselves. Always feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Uh, the deck will have um, our emails if you want to follow up with us as well. Thank you to everyone who joined us today. Uh, please do keep an eye out for registration for our upcoming webinars, including the ones that we highlighted today. They'll be coming throughout the year, as well as the AI and technology commercialization one that I mentioned earlier that will occur uh, in a later April. In the meantime, we wish you all well and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone, for joining us.